Hi everyone, welcome back to The Bubbly Stuffer. This is a bit of a different video. I This is my 300 subscriber giveaway video. So I have three um, prizes to give away. I don't know whether we need some light in here. Um, so thank you, thank you to everyone who has subscribed, liked, commented on my videos. I never thought I would get to 100 subscribers, let alone 300. And I started in September last year. So I think it's a bit over six months and I got to 300 subscribers. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Uh, and I'm very, very happy with that. So I um, have got three giveaways. So the rules are you need to be over 18, publicly subscribed, and it closes on the 28th of April, 2024. And the first one, you need to put in the hashtag. This is from um, Snowgarner307, hashtag bath. And because I am the bubbly stuffer, I tried to look for lots of challenges with bubbles on them. So this is Georgette in a bath. And these are double-sided challenges. And then there is a colorful camouflage. One that's really pretty on the back of that, the printing on that. And then Mui's Christmas. And there's a double-sided one of that as well. So that is hashtag bath. And I'm going to do Q&A as well with this. So, um, and then this is from the Liz, the lovely Liz and Les. She's also in America as well. So I wanted pop the bubbly again, because the bubbly stuff. Huh? So this one is hashtag pop. So you got this challenge. These are sticker challenges and per perga in that and then the last one is hashtag relax and because they're in a bubble bath self-care a space challenge and then the bookworm challenge so they're the three giveaways for 300 subscribers um hashtags are on them and you can only win once. So if you win one hashtag, then um, I'll take you out of the running for the other ones. Um, and it is open to everybody. I'm hoping some Australians will win, but it is open to everyone because I do have some, um, quite a few overseas followers as well. So that's the, the giveaway details. Then I did put a post up on Instagram and on YouTube about Q&A and anything that you can ask anything. So I had quite a few people ask. I've got my notes over here, so I stay on track. Um, lots of people asked me about my Stampin' Up. Um, I had a couple of people, because in one of my intro videos a long time ago, I talked about IVF. So I had a couple of people PM me about my IVF journey and then the debt journey. So I thought I'd go through a lot of that detail for everyone. So for my Stamping Up journey, I'll just show a couple of things that I've got here. I am a Stamping Up independent demonstrator. I have been for 10 years. I am a leader. So that's why I went to Vegas last year for the leaders conference and things like that. So a leader means that I have a team underneath me of at least five people. I currently have about 10 people in my team um, and I have a certain amount of sales each year to qualify as a leader. So I've, yeah, I've been doing it for 10 years. I did do a lot of in-person classes for a number of years. Uh, I don't know how much you can see on here. So I'm just laying out cards that I've made in the last couple of days. Um, and I, um, I was doing a lot of in-person classes and then COVID forced me to pretty much go online. I had been trying to go online prior to that, but it was a little bit difficult. But once COVID came, it um, made it a lot easier. So I do online classes. I was doing two a month for a while. I have cut back to one a month at, for the time being. Um, and some months I have... Um, up to so my next class in the april class i have 
um, 16 people doing that class. And then other classes I only have like 10, 10 people doing classes. So it really depends on the class and um, the type of products that we're doing. So I do it online. You get most of the kit with you. Some, And I have lots of people in different states doing them. So I am in Queensland, but I have um, a couple of people in um, New South Wales, a couple of people in um, Victoria doing classes as well. Oh, because they are online, you don't have to be in, in Brisbane to do them. Oh, buddy. Out. So, yeah, I do that. Um, I have just come back from Melbourne on stage. On stage is a demonstrator only event where all the demonstrators get together and um, create, see new products and things like that. So we've just come back from that in Melbourne. The next one is in Brisbane for next year. So I'm saving for that as well. I, from a budgeting point of view, I, the last, since COVID, I've been able to um, support my stamping up business through my sales of classes and customers and not have to pay for any of it out of my budget. But um, prior to COVID, I was paying for a lot of the products and stuff out of my own pocket. But now my business is, well, my stamping up business is kind of a little bit sustainable with that. Now with my um, conferences to Vegas and to Melbourne and even the one in Brisbane, that money does come out of my own personal money to fund those conferences. I don't earn enough from stamping up to be able to pay for those conferences. I'm not that big. Um, I do a Facebook Live every Monday night. I have another YouTube channel with um, that I post weekly on that for all the stamping up projects that I do and things like that. Um, there wasn't any specific questions. I just wanted to know about my Stampin' Up! journey. So, yeah. Um, hopefully that answers a lot of questions. I've um, made lifelong friends with it. I really enjoy it. I never realised why I enjoy it, but I work in a pretty... I wouldn't say stressful, but it's a pretty um, intense job in which... I have to use my brain a lot um, and I like crafting and creating because when I do this my I don't think of anything else like I can actually switch off and just get in the mood and do that and so I didn't realize that's why I like it so much but especially with COVID there was a lot of studies that came out that said um, like being creative and using your hands really helps um, relax your mind and, and stuff like that. And so then it, it really occurred to me that's one of the reasons why I really like this because I am able to switch off and I don't have to think about what I'm doing. Um, when I'm doing it, I just kind of create. Now, I don't think I'm very create, create, what is it? I don't think I have a lot of creativity. I, I can see a lot of things on Pinterest and come up with things, but we've got, like we get given some of these templates, right? So I've, I make that card, like I've, I've copied that card and then I've recreated that card um, here with that one. And I did another one with this as well. So it's the same like sketch layout and you just then redo it with different colors, different cards, or like different stamps and things like that. But um, yeah, now I need to work out which ones I've photographed and put up on. I used to have a separate website for my um, stamping up, but I've recently um, done away with that because it was costing me about $600 a year to maintain that and I didn't think it was actually worth it. So. This is my next in-person class. So I do a sip and stamp event on a Friday night once a month. Um, and we will do those cards. 
So these two cards and they get a glass, like a beverage of whatever they want. Um, so they can, I get, I limit it to six people because it's around my dining room table and I don't have that much room. But um, that's priced at $15 to make the two cards and they get a choice of um, drink which is priced at that they could have one of those little um, single glass bottles of wine, really. But uh, most of the ladies that come have coffee, tea, a soft drink or something like that. So that's awesome. But that's that class. I haven't designed my next class, have I? Yes, I have designed my next class. Let me just get the cards Yeah. One, two, three. So then this is the next online class. So as so all you need for the um for the class is the inks to colour the cards and to stamp. I supply all the rest of the material and you need um a sentiment stamp set so to stamp the words. But I supply everything else to that. So we make that card. We will make this card. And then we will make this card. So you make three cards and that class I price at $30. And I run it through a Zoom, um, which means that the class is recorded as well. So if you can't make it as a live class, then you get an online, then you can get the recording at a later date to do that. Now, I think that's it about stamping up. I really can't talk about it too much. If anyone's got any other specific questions, I'm happy to answer them, uh, especially from a budgeting or money point of view. But from any point of view, I'm happy to talk about stamping up all day, really. So um, my IVF journey, I did seven years of IVF. Uh, it was very long and grueling and very expensive. And that's pretty much, at the time when you're going through it, I I had always budgeted, but I never reconciled my budget. So I'd go, oh, we budget this and then work out why I've got no money at the end. I never, ever reconciled my budget. Um, but while you're going through it, you kind of just work out what happens. So this little bit goes on the credit card. This little bit gets redrawn out of the mortgage. This happens, that happens and things. So my husband um, had, both my husband and I had issues, which is why we... Uh, we were told we had less than 1% chance of falling pregnant naturally. Um, but my husband had to have some tests which were about $3,000, which weren't covered by Medicare or private health or anything like that. So we had those tests. Each round of IVF was about seven, seven and a half thousand. My first two rounds, they were, I did get some back from Medicare and I got about three grand back. Then they changed the rules and I no longer met the criteria to get any money back from Medicare. So then I had to fund each new round ourselves. Um, and then we, I, I didn't know at the time of doing this that so many people now these days are actually accessing their superannuation funds, which are retirement savings. And if you fill in a form and it's deemed that it's... Um, it's accepted a lot of super funds are releasing those monies to pay for uh, medical procedures such as IVF and weight loss surgery and things like that but at the time I didn't know that was an option and I really really wish that I had a known that was an option because I have worked full-time my whole life and I have a very substantial superannuation fund for my age um, and yeah, if I could have funded each round of IVF out of that, that would have been amazing. Instead, we funded it out of cash flow, put things on credit cards, we had a personal loan, we redrew on our mortgage. And I just, I think this is where the comparison thing came in. And that's why I like in all my videos, in my um, description box, I say comparison is a thief of all joy because I was watching a lot of other people our age 
and they were upsizing their mortgages or they were getting newer houses because we were still in our first house and we always knew it was going to be our first house but our intention was that we were only going to be in there for five years and then move on but in that five years um we were told that um we would have to do IVF to have children and things so then you just get on the IVF merry-go-round I call it and uh we were never successful in that um, to have any embryos that would freeze. So each round of IVF, I would get a fresh transfer, but that was it. There was no freezing of embryos, which meant we had to save up another seven or find another $7,000 to do the next round. Whereas a lot of people are lucky enough that they would do a round of IVF for the $7,000, but they get five or six eggs or embryos that could freeze. And so then you have fresh transfer that doesn't work. The next month you can have another fresh transfer and that's only a couple of hundred dollars to implant that. Whereas we never got any frozen embryos to have that second or third transfer or anything. So each time we had to come up with another $7,000 um we I think on my fifth fifth um round we got pregnant uh we got to 13 weeks with twins and then we lost the twins um I completely freaked out at the fact of having twins because my a lot of my family call like call me the budget queen um and I had budgeted one lot of daycare, one lot of school fees, one lot of this, one lot of that. And the fact that I ended up pregnant with two, I completely freaked out and had a massive meltdown. And I, I don't know whether that is what contributed to the miscarriage or whether it was natural or, or what. But I just look back at it. It was heartbreaking at the time. Um, but... I just look back at it and say, I, I don't know that I was mentally prepared for that. And I think it was God's way of, of helping me seriously, because I just don't know that I would have come out as healthy as I am on the other side, if that was what happened. Um, and then we took a couple of months off after that, um, cause it was a long time that I hadn't had any drugs in my system at all from a fertility perspective. And then we recommenced our journey about 18 months after that. And, um, I had been seeing a personal trainer for the 12 months because I, we were pretty much, we we're pretty much done and spent I I was done physically and mentally emotionally financially that this next round was going to be our last round because I also didn't want to be an old mum um because I was now pushing so I'm 42 and my son is nine so I was my son is turning nine so I was pushing 31 32 and obviously the older you get, the um, the higher the risks. And I was already considered a high risk pregnancy um, because of IVF. So I had been seeing a personal trainer for 12 months. I was the fittest I was ever gonna be um, and things. We went back and I changed IVF doctors because I went to see my previous IVF doctor and he goes, you're still overweight. Um, you need to lose more weight. And I'm like, I've been seeing a PT for uh, over 12 months. I've lost like 57 centimetres, but I'd only lost eight kilos. And in all honesty, I'm overweight. I know that. Um, and it's due to the polycystic ovaries. But I am overweight. Um, but I know plenty of people overweight that fall pregnant. And I'm like, it's... And But he turned around and said to me, it's not that hard to lose weight. I've just lost 15 kilos. And I kind of turned around and told him where to go and found a new doctor. 
and that's when they found a lot of other issues with me because now it had been over five years since I'd been off um, any contraceptive or anything like that. So um, we found a few more things. We changed up the treatment plan and it worked. We we actually got pregnant and it stuck and it it stayed. And we also got a fresh we got a embryo to freeze, which had never happened our whole journey or anything. So, um, yeah, we were lucky enough to then to have Hunter um, and um, then after we had had, so you've got to pay storage on any frozen embryos. And the, those storage costs come in whilst you're still pregnant, which I just, I really think this whole system needs an overhaul um, because once you go through it, it's it's not a pleasant experience when you're doing it. Um, so I, I paid one lot of storage fees and then I paid a second lot of storage fees because they come every six months. And then I'd paid another lot of storage fees and then I just said to my husband, I just, I, we had already agreed that this was going to be our last round. Whether we were successful or not, this was going to be it. Um, and I said to him, I said, I just can't go back on that merry-go-round again. Because if we choose to use that embryo and it doesn't work, then to me, you're back on that merry-go-round again. And um, so we did end up donating that embryo to science. I had always said when I was younger that I was, um, I'd be happily happy to donate my eggs or anything to anybody. But once you actually have a child, that's a really hard decision to make. And I really struggled with the thought that that could, a hunter could have a sibling out there to somebody. So I donated the frozen embryo to research for that reason. Um, so obviously then that ties into like our debt journey really or debt free journey so this whole time we were both working but we were just finding money wherever we could to pay for the next round of IVF and at 7,000 bucks a pop and you get nothing back like I had private health um, that would cover for my hospital stay for the egg retrieval and the implantation and things because they're all done in a in a hospital bed um, so that would pay for that but other than that it didn't really cost very much I didn't really cover very much at all so that 7,000 you're out of pocket each time um, so then once um, Hunter was born I I only had seven months off for maternity leave because I'm the higher income earner compared to my husband he decided at the time that if he was going to be the stay-at-home carer he would um, use that time to study and to um, better himself and have a career change because he wanted to go from a blue collar worker to a white collar worker in that um, he wanted to have weekends off and um, not have to work like shift work or anything like that. So he um, completed his degree whilst I went back to work and he was the primary caregiver for our son. And then um, my son started prep and that was when we were um, ready for my husband to, like he was finished his degree and ready to go back into work. But that was also when COVID hit. And so he had a lot of these interviews all lined up and it was looking amazing and then everything stopped. Um, and we, like, there was no potential for anything and um, everything got pulled. I had also been made redundant at work. Um, I was still working at the same place, but I, um, there was a redundancy on the table, which was cause I've been at my employer for 18 years at this time. I had been there for 15 odd years. Um, it was a six figure salary, a six figure lump sum for my redundancy, 
But at the time, given that I was the sole income earner, it was COVID. There were no, not a lot of job opportunities. And there was 1,200 of us made redundant at the time. And over 400 were in Brisbane. And the industry that I work in is quite small. So we were all competing for the same roles. And I just, I wasn't getting any traction or anything. So then I'm like, I had to do whatever I could to find an alternative job within the company that I work so that I could stay and keep that same salary, keep the same benefits that I've got and, and things like that. So did that. But at that time, that's when like we just really started going backwards and I found the Barefoot Investor. I used his calculator and our daily expenses, because his idea is that you have 60% in daily expenses, 20% towards fire, 20% towards smile, and 10% towards something else. I can't remember. Can't remember the buckets, but it's 60, 20, 20, 10. Um, and when I calculated our daily expenses, they were 101%. So I'm like, well, no wonder we're going backwards because... <laughs> our just our everyday expenses is greater than our income at this point in time uh yes we were paying daycare and things so um but it was uh so it was as my son was finishing daycare and going to prep that I kind of found um barefoot and we um did a few things so my husband um because he wasn't working during the or during COVID, the government allowed people to um, take up to ten thousand dollars out of their super before, like the end of one financial year, and then ten thousand dollars next financial year, just to give people access to some money because the government wasn't paying anybody else. Like my husband didn't get any benefits from Centrelink or anything because I earned too much. Um, but he did meet the criteria to take the money out of super. So we did take the 10,000 10, out and we cleared one credit card and we took the other 10,000 out and we cleared um, the flexi loan that we had um, and closed the flexi loan altogether so that that was never going to come back because um, the year prior I had paid $8,000 off that flexi loan and the balance hadn't moved because I paid off and then I'd redraw it back, paid off and redraw it back. And I'm like, this is shit. That was my big turning point going, we've paid $8,000 off this card last year and the balance hasn't reduced at all. So that was the real kick up the bum that then found me to um, barefoot. And so by doing that, it freed up like $500 a fortnight to be able to continue paying daycare and then daycare finished. And even though my son goes to a private school, the private school fees are a third of what we we're paying in daycare. So all of that kind of culminated at the one time. And then a month after my um, son started school, my husband got a job. And so then we were then back to a two income family. So since then, we've been trying to live off one income and pay all our debt and things like that because for four years we were only on my income so we had paid all our debt we're saving money like crazy but in that meantime we had to buy a car because our car stopped working and then the plan always was because our we were still in our first house and our first house was so tiny like it was three bedroom house one bathroom there was just no room. Like the bigger Hunter got, the smaller the house got and things. So the idea was that we we're always going to go into a second house, another house. Um, so then we saved up enough for a deposit as well. And then we've moved into this house. So when we moved into this house, we were debt free, except for the mortgage. But when you, can't, when you go into a new house, like our mortgage, our mortgage had tripled because we did upsize. This house was sold as a seven bedroom house. It is not seven bedrooms. Um, they renovated a, two, a double lock up garage and put two rooms in that that they were selling as bedrooms, but you can only get a double bed in there and no bedside tables, no wardrobes, no nothing. So those are now our offices because my husband and I both work from home. 
um, 50% of the time and then go in the office 50% of the time. So we have our space. So mine is my work office plus my craft space and his is just his work office. Um, and then one of the other bedrooms, it's not really a bedroom. It's currently got the treadmill in it and that's all that really fits in there. So it was set up as an office with a little really skinny desk because it's not... I don't even know what size it is. Eventually, I want to knock down a wall and that would become a walk-in robe. That's how small it is. So, um, yeah. But um, when we came here and we, we got some new furniture, we got this and then out because our mortgage had tripled and we were just getting everything that we needed for the house, then um, that's kind of how that credit card crept up again. And so now we're on a mission again to repay that credit card because I don't want it anymore. Like, we still need a credit card. I do a lot of travel for work and I do, um, we use the points on the credit card and obviously we have a lot of bills on our credit card. Um, but, and the bill stuff is paid off all the time because I've got a bills account. So as soon as the bill hits the credit card, it gets transferred off straight away. Um, but it's just the little incidentals that, oh, this happened or this happened and we just tap, tap, tap and back to owing money on it. So that was this year's mission is to, to remove that credit card to get back to debt free. I don't particularly count Adrian's, um, hex debt as a debt. He still has one. I've paid, my hex debt is gone. Um, we are still paying it because ideally I would like that paid off. Um, before because we are on a fixed rate for our mortgage and that finishes in 2026 so I would like to make sure that that hex debt is paid off before then because um, then we essentially will get a pay rise because how hex debt works in Australia it's like um, student loan debt but my husband um, earns a certain amount and then uh, before he gets paid uh, his paycheck, uh, tax comes out of that and hex payment. So they automatically garnish your wage to pay that. So it'll be like getting a pay rise because there's like $500 a month that comes out of his pay to go towards his hex debt. Um, so I'd like to remove like a pay off that hex debt before the fixed rate finishes because it'll be like getting a pay rise and then hopefully by then the interest rates have settled down a bit. And not so crazy that then if the mortgage repayments do go up, it's not going to break the bank as much. But that is a lot of waffle and answering questions that people have PM'd me or left me on Instagram and YouTube. If you have any other questions, let me know. Uh, but don't forget about the giveaway and the hashtags of bath, relax, and pop. And um, thank you everyone for listening. And if you've got any other questions, just let me know. But if you could like, subscribe, and leave a comment, that would be really amazing. And I'll talk to you in the next one. Thanks everyone.